everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. And a shout out to our event hosts, BuzzFeed and First Mark. Uh, let's give them a round of applause for having us. Uh, also, today I just learned that DigitalOcean, the company that I work at, partners with Firstmark for our startup program, uh, which gets startups like up to $100,000 in infrastructure credits. So I have a link at the end of this presentation if you're a startup and you're interested in hearing more. Also, I do want to announce that we're hiring UX designers and researchers. So if you're interested in some of the things that I talk about in this presentation today, since you're here today, I love that. Um, just talk to me after. So this talk is about how to inject accessibility into your company in a scalable way. My name is Una Kravitz. You can find me on the internet at UNA. That's everything like GitHub, Twitter, CodePen, all those things. Um, and I've had a bit of experience with design systems. I used to work on the Watson design system, the beginning of that, when I was working at IBM. Then I moved to Bluemix at IBM, where I was working on the beginnings of what is now the Carbon design system. And currently, I work at DigitalOcean on a product called Buoy. So when I say accessibility, I really mean scaling good practices through something like a design system and through component libraries. And I'm gonna just kind of use those interchangeably during this presentation. I found this to be the best way to scale accessibility. It's like a baseline, it's a path of least resistance for your users and for your company. And this is because by definition, systems scale. They're made to scale. Here's the thing about systems in general. Good practices scale. They allow for good practices scale when you have a system like this. But also keep in mind that bad practices scale. So this thing that we have to kind of inject from the start and make sure that we're always putting good practices into our work. So in this talk, I'll go through some basic tenets to allow design systems to scale good practices. And those are communication, testing, documentation, and finally we'll talk about versioning. So when we talk about accessibility, the important thing to know is that it can't be an individual's job. There's just too much going on. There are too many considerations and moving parts. We went through a lot of those during this presentation already that were earlier. Nobody can be on top of this product development process alone. It takes a whole village and really an entire company to push accessibility. So when I say that accessibility is a team problem, I mean that it is a company-wide problem. Anybody that is involved in the development lifecycle from product management to design to development to backend engineers to if you have a QA team, the entire company is involved here. So this is uh, real footage of a man delivering a computer monitor. Really? It's also real footage of what normally happens when individuals and teams have accessibility as something they want to work on. They usually just like pass it off to someone else, throw it over the fence to another team. This is often what we see at companies, and it's a broken system, like that broken monitor. We can't do this, so we can't do this. It'll just cause headache. And the reason you can't do this is because accessibility is a team effort. It's something that has to be considered on every single part of the product lifecycle. And here's just a few examples where that holds true. So in UX, this is content hierarchy and order. It's user flow. It's where you have captions in your images, where you have that alt text. For visual design, this is everything from sizing buttons to sizing text from color contrast to animation rules, making sure that um, because some people have vestibular disorder, you can't have animations just play at a really fast rate. This is having iconography along with any colors to indicate items within your component library, your design system, and your product. With code, there's a lot that you can do here. So control systems involve like keyboard navigation, trapping focus on certain elements. There's also static analysis of websites like ARIA labels and semantic markup. So there's just a lot going on. And there are things that I didn't even include here, like having captions with your videos, and those other things that the WCAG requires for accessibility compliance. When accessibility is a core value, it's something that you can refer to to get buy-in and to make sure that everyone in your company is on the same page. Unfortunately, at a lot of companies, a big reason why accessibility isn't really considered or fails in terms of company adoption is because not everyone is assessed on creating accessible experiences. That's a problem, because who would spend extra time working on something that's not gonna help them in their career? When their manager isn't going to be looking at how accessible they made a product um, when they're considering raises or promotions. Nobody, no developer is gonna make their life cycle longer when they're being judged on building products quickly, just to build accessibility in there. And that's why it's so important to make accessibility a core value 
across the entire company, project management specifically, so that they know this is important, because that's how lawsuits happen. Tyson talked about that a little bit in the beginning. He talked about Section 508. He talked about how important it is for us to have accessible experiences on the web. In our physical spaces, it's important. It's also important in our digital spaces. So making sure that this is a value that is core across the company is something that can help with this. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is testing. Are any of you Game of Thrones fans? Continuous testing is the next step in making sure your good practices scale at your company. Testing should occur on each step of the product development process and lifecycle that I kind of just went over. So in UX, there should be user testing for content flow and user flow. Does this hold up on the page? Is this how users who are navigating with screen readers or assistive technology also flow through the content? In design, every new component should be tested for color contrast and color blindness. Does the component make sense? Is it differentiated from other similar components? When you use a design system for this sort of thing, it's easier to do this kind of testing because all of your components are sort of consolidated into one space. And you can use that live documentation site to do this testing on. With development, there are many different ways to test, including static evaluation tools, um, for testing some of those operability items that Tyson was talking about. And there's also a focus in keyboard controls that you can manually tap through or use um, various testing tools um, that will create actions and kind of have like a fake browser work through your system as well. So ideally, there would be another QA team to then run through every pull request again and test these things again in case something was missed. But that doesn't tend to exist very often, which makes it even more important for every team to focus on continually testing their product themselves. If you're just starting to think about accessibility in your design system, a visual audit is a great idea for how to start. So we decided to take accessibility much more seriously at DO and amped up the effort on both the design and development landscape a few months ago. This work was done by Masabi Kubo, which is one of the product designers on the brand team, where she did a visual audit. And we were alerted to this by using some of those stack analysis tools that look through the code and look through the color contrast. The first thing we did was analyze the color contrast of our basic buttons. And we saw that we had a few problems here, like specifically with the red and green colors. I'm telling you, green buttons are like impossible to find. Accessible green buttons are the true unicorns of the web. I tried to find good examples. No, nothing, nothing. GitHub, like um, everything, ZocDoc. I have examples here of Robinhood. Every site that has green, except for Uber, they had a dark green, they did well. But it's so hard to find these green buttons. It's like a big problem. No one's talking about it, the big green button problem. Anyway, so next she looked at um, how we had alerts presented by using um, so a tool that looked at different types of color blindness. So this was an example of red-green color blindness, which is the most common kind. And you can see that even though these are different types of alerts, they're hard to differentiate when you don't have um, the correct vision. So what is a green alert? What is a red alert? What's a danger alert? What's a success alert? You can't really tell here. So we decided to make icons a requirement for alerts and other bits of information to improve understanding of the content we're providing. And then we're going to document this discovery and you know, design rule in our design system. So there's more than just color blindness, though, which is why it's important to look at contrast. It's really important. We couldn't just let it go that our green button wasn't accessible. So we ended up playing with various designs to see other solutions for our design system. We ended up redesigning all of our alerts. So there was some kind of unity there, so that that green alert and that green button were legible for people. This is important content for the user to get. And so it was important to go through and kind of look at the system as a whole and how we can improve it as a whole to make everything cohesive and also accessible. So in the development world, you can also test color contrast as well as a myriad of other things um, with tools. We have so many tools you can use here. Static analysis tools are a great way to get some of those low-hanging fruits, like adding language equals en to your HTML, or making sure that every form component has a label. These stack analysis tools literally tell you what line of code your error is on and how to fix it and why to fix it. And there's so many tools here. Um, something that was briefly mentioned was webaim.org in the last presentation. They have a really great Chrome extension. They have a really great tool that you can use. It's also a website. This is a screenshot from the website. You can put any web address in there and it'll evaluate the site for you. So I use this tool all the time. It's what I used in that last example uh, right here. This is using that webaim tool. 
There's also a tool called Axe, which is the accessibility engine. This is actually a company that has a suite of products that help you with accessibility. Um, and I use a Chrome extension along with the Wave tool to run through testing for static analysis of my pages. And this also shows a lot of different errors like contrast, um, if you're missing any elements, if you have semantic things out of place, if your heading levels are out of place, all these things that relate to the accessibility of your product. And then finally, there's an extension that builds in uh, accessibility audits in the Chrome dev tools. Um, the URL is really long for this, but if you just search accessibility developer tools on the Chrome extension store, you'll find it. And it adds a little checkbox in your dev tools to run the accessibility audits without having to have like a little icon in your screen. So a lot of these do similar things, but I'm just trying to demonstrate how many variety of options and tools you have out there. Then, once you've done all that manual testing to get your system up to date, you should be continually monitoring it for an introduction of any non-accessible components. So ideally, you catch this before shipping your system, but since we can't always control what other people do, something like this tool called Pally could do that for you. It'll continually test front-end systems to see how many errors, warnings, and notices you have in your product. So you can see here, uh, it's a dashboard view of Pally, um, which shows you how many warnings, errors, and notices you have over time, and also information on how to fix them. This is something that we implemented at DigitalOcean when I was working on improving our accessibility, and it was really cool to see those numbers start to really dramatically lower down. And it proved the value of our team as well. So when you have metrics like this, it can help get your point across to the rest of your team. Um, if you'd like to set up a dashboard, I wrote an article about it at this address, yuna.im slash pally dash dash. Um, that was really bad, but you can see it. Uh, so, <laughs> so everything's in here about like setting up the server for this, setting up the module itself. Um, so if you're interested in setting something like this up for your own team or your own project, that's a good start. Uh, pally is also a team that has a few different products um, on GitHub, they have a CI tool, CLI tool. They have other systems they're working on right now, and they're always extending this. So another really great project to get involved in. They could definitely use designers and more developers and more minds on this. All right, let's talk about documentation. Documentation is everything. Document your accessibility-focused design principles so that people can learn about them. This is all about education. And they don't have to ask you questions. And if people do ask questions, then add those to the documentation. It means that your docs weren't clear enough, and that's okay. It's an iterative process. If you're putting the time and effort into accessibility, make sure the new rules you're implementing are written down somewhere. Make sure that people know about them. A design systems documentation page is a great place for this along with your code components, along with your code documentation. It can all live in the same place. So also on that note, make sure that your technical documentation is up to date. Since design systems are intended to make developers' lives easier, they will copy and paste this code into the product when they're working. So you wanna make sure they're getting the latest, most accurate information instead of introducing bugs. Here you can see how bad practices can scale, inaccessible components can scale, and you want them to be scaling those good practices, those good components, not introducing cruft they're gonna to have to then go through and fix and iterate on. You can also use a space to explain markup decisions, why they have to have um, form labels with all of their inputs. Um, here's an example of if you wanted to have a label that didn't have a form visually with it, use a class of SR only, which is screen reader only, it'll visually hide the text. So having those sorts of accessible utilities also helps with injecting this into your company system. Most importantly, make sure that this code samples are up to date. This is really important. I'm telling you people will copy and paste, you don't wanna deal with this mess. Versioning is the last piece of the puzzle that I'm going to talk about today. So using a you know, unified versioning system across design and development can keep your systems up to date, helping you to build and maintain an accessible system. Every design system that I've worked on to the state has used something called SEMVER, which stands for semantic versioning. And the way that it works is through a series of major, minor, and patches. So if we have this number 1.3.17, that means there was one major release, there were three minor releases, and there were 17 patches or bug fixes. So right now, I'm building this new design system, and I'm mostly focusing on using minor patches. Um, so I'm working on 
you know, number 0.19.2 right now. So I've had 19 pieces of breaking changes, but it hasn't been released yet, it's still in beta. Um, two things that maybe update colors or update documentation, something like that that won't affect any markup. And then when we have our first major release, that'll be number one, it'll be 1.0.0. If you already have a product that's out there and you have any kind of breaking changes, so with the design system that means um, any white space changes, if a component changes, if the markup changes, then you'll have to re-release it as version 2.0.0, since people are already using it. Since we have a system like this, when developers use our design system, they're not gonna be breaking any existing code and they can implement it over time. When I was working at IBM, the timeline for implementing design systems, versions of a single design system, was like six months to a year. And that's just how it was. You had to give people time and let it roll out. So with Sember, we don't just use this for code, we also use this for our design components. We have a craft library and we use Sketch with our design components, so we try to keep those in sync. And that's how you can make sure that you're using a certain version of your component library, that component library version matches with a certain version of the design system, visual assets, and those will always kind of hold and speak to each other. So I don't have like a lot of time to go over all the details of the implementation right now, but I'm super, super happy to chat with anyone afterwards if you're curious about that stuff as well. The design system will help enable accessibility if and only if you keep it up. A lot of companies get this revelation, like, oh, we need a design system, that's super trendy. Let's make a team and then have them work on it for three months and then we'll ship it. I like to think of a design system as going to the gym. You can do a lot in a short amount of time. You'll see some gains, you know, if you work on it for three months, if you go to the gym for three months, you'll be more fit. But when you stop, those gains will quickly fade. If you don't keep it up, you'll get worse. You'll be creating cruft until it gets so out of shape that you need to go back and do another intense three-month session of dieting and working out or refactoring, updating, and designing. But a little bit of work over time will show better gains and it'll be easier to maintain. So this all brings us back to the beginning. It does take a little bit of advocacy to make sure everyone's on the same page here, but it's so worth it because good practices scale. Accessibility can scale if you put in the work to let it. So scale your good practices. Thank you.